6th. And uh, for the time being, final instalment of this six-part overview of the whole of Jewish history. And uh, this, of course, uh, uh, series has been sponsored uh, in the main by Chabad of South Africa, uh, where this is being streamed live, and also uh, by Dominion Shul in Melbourne, the Shul of Love. And, uh, of course, I welcome our esteemed studio audience here this evening, as always. Yay. Settle down. So, the, as promised, uh, well, well, let's once again, let's not waste any time. Let's, now, this is minus 2,000, and this is 2,000. So, this is a familiar pattern already, or should be. Uh, this is the span of Jewish history. And as we have uh, outlined many times, the whole of Jewish history can be broken up into discrete 500-year phases. Each phase has a key spiritual project. Understand the key spiritual continuum within each phase, or how rather the larger continuum of the Jewish people in the world is being thrust forward in time through these phases. You understand the key project, all the details will fit in and it will all work. And so that's a framework, not made up by me, perhaps observed by me a bit more than others, but not made up by me. These epochs are ingrained within our traditional understanding of Jewish history, whether we are talking within a religious context or an academic context. Now, as you would know, the first week we did uh, this period here. And what's that called? Bai Cheni, exactly. That's the second temple. And that's where I started. I started with the decree of Cyrus and the return of the remnant of, the, of, of Israel, the, the people of Judah, from the exile in Babylon to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. So this, but the second temple. Then, following which, the next 500 years we had what? The Talmudic. Excellent. People have been paying attention. Then it was followed by this period here, 500 to 1000, which we call the Garnic. What an outstanding studio audience we have here this evening. That was then followed by this 500 year period here, which we call the period of the Rishonim. Very good. Or the Middle Ages, if you want, but we refer to it as the Rishonim. And then we had... Uh, this uh, spectacular period last week, which was 1500 to 2000, which we are going to call the Acharonim, the latter ones, according to some authorities that ended around about 1990, 2000. We may well be kind of in the uh, beginnings of a new phase, and it sure feels like that in some ways. However, as promised, tonight, or today, this afternoon, I'm going to go to the very beginning and I'm going to show all the way up to here a period of around 1800 years or nearly 2000 years because that period, not 2000, five, ten, sorry, 1300 years, nearly 1500 years, sorry. And that period I'm doing discreetly now because that period of Jewish history is the entire historical arc covered by the Bible. Or, as we might more correctly refer to it, and as I'm hoping we will always refer to it after this talk, the Tanakh. And of course, we'll unpack that word Tanakh in a moment, uh, but now I'm going to wipe this off. Do we have the squidgy? Yep. I'm going to wipe this off. And I'm going to zoom in on the biblical period of Jewish history. And then I'm going to explain what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to do it. I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to call this minus 2000. And I'm going to call this minus 500. Does everybody understand what I've done here? Minus 1,500, minus 1,000. 
This is going to get very busy. Perhaps, perhaps, bear with me, I'm winging this. I'm doing something on the hop, but I think it's actually going to be better. I know how this is going to end up. So I'm going to do something a little different. I don't want anybody to get confused. Certainly no more confused than I am. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to call this one minus 2000 to minus 1500. I'm going to call this minus 1500 to minus 1000. And I'm going to call this minus 1000 to minus 500. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so really that belongs over there and so on, but you'll get the idea. And there's perhaps an, a, a good uh, reason for doing it that way, because here's what I'm going to do. I want to, in the first kind of half, I know I've used up six minutes, seven minutes already, but I want to, in the first half of this talk, to lay down all of the historical tracks so that we get the sense of the arc, of not Noah's Ark, the arc of where it's all going historically, what the, where the starting points are and where we finish up in the biblical period. That narrative, because without that narrative, it's very, very difficult to contextualize the books of the Tanakh, the books of the Bible. In the second half of the talk, having laid those historical tracks, I'm going to place each book in its historical context. And I find that exercise very useful, and I hope you will as well, using this framework. So that's one thing I want to say, uh, so that you understand what I'm going to do. I'm not going to talk about specific books of the Bible just now. We're going to go through as a Jewish history line, and then we're going to put the books on. But the other reason why the three lines is, or the breakup of three is interesting, is because really the Bible, when we get down to it, and I'm now in the historiography of what we're going to talk about, is that each of these 500 year blocks, once again, this pattern of 500 years, represents a particular phase. And before we go into the details of that phase, I want to say something very general. I don't want anybody running out of the room screaming in confusion or shouting apicursus and uh, setting fire to the internet. <laughs> I, I want everybody to stay calm. But I'm going to talk about these three phases in historiographic terms as academics would understand them, as scholars of history, objective history would understand them. I'm fully aware that the Jewish people have their own inner traditions regarding these periods. The Bible is a very delicate subject. It's a very delicate subject. It's sensitive for some people and nothing I'm saying needs to contradict anyone's sensitivities because I try and stick to what we know. However, everything that happens in this period here, we could label, we could categorize by the term theohistorical. We do not have direct evidence of any particular event or person specifically related to Jewish history in this period. We have some, maybe some intuitions in some directions, but we have no proof, we have no evidence. This period here is in the realm of what I call the theohistorical, but what others would call myth. Now, the word myth worries people because they think the word myth means something is not true because it has that common meaning in everyday language. But that's not the meaning of myth when we talk about history and we, certainly not when we talk about the history of the Jewish people. I'm not saying that this didn't happen. I'm saying we have no evidence for it. Therefore, because this period forms the foundations of our charter of belief in the world, the covenantal relationship between the Avot and God that is established in this period, 
are the whole reason for the continuum of Jewish history. But it's not capital H history yet. This period here is what we might call, what historians might be happy to call, in terms of Jewish history, proto-historical. That is, we still don't necessarily have any absolute direct evidence of specific persons and events here, but we have an, a lot and an increasing amount of archaeological and other types of evidence that background the biblical narrative. And so far we haven't really found anything that conflicts with the biblical narrative and our knowledge of that period grows all the time. We know that there were new peoples in the Middle East, that it was a time of great upheaval and new settlements. We know that some nations came to settle in the Levant who brought with them different ways of doing things and different ways of seeing things. This is a very, very transitional period, the proto-historical. And this period takes us from the proto-historical into the historical. Because by the time we get to about here, we are definitively an entity in history, not just according to our own accounts, but we're actually being talked about in the histories of other peoples. We are a definitive objective entity in the world. And I can tell you that we didn't hatch out of an egg. So even though we don't have yet the evidences for a number of these different phases, uh, we nevertheless have some very, very strong oral indications and oral knowledge and transferred histories that would indicate that much of what the Bible describes is not that far from uh, what happened. But I'm going to go back and I'm just going to go through this now in a historical arc. This period, minus 2000 to minus 1500, is, has a general term in Jewish history because it's known as the period of the Avot. And of course, it's not just the period of the Avot, it's the, also the period of the Imahot, it's not just the period of the patriarchs, but also of the matriarchs. And what we are talking about when we talk about the Avot is primarily we are talking about Abraham, his son Isaac, and his son Jacob, who together form the foundational understanding of the covenantal relationship that the Jewish people had has with God. I, I, I got distracted because I want to just go over something I said a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> In fact, I will say it in a minute. I found a relevant place to slot it. So bear with me. I'm, 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 I'm going along uh, as I see it. And uh, of course, Jacob's son, Joseph, is approximately here. Now, when <coughs> the, I know that I said this is a theo-historical period, but when we talk about these persons in Jewish history, we are talking about them in the context of where Jewish history would project them to if we understand them to be actual people that lived. They would be living in this period here. The period, the foundational period of the Avot. Joseph is a pivotal figure because he is the one that really transitions us to the proto-historical and he brings the descendants of Jacob. That is, Jacob has 12 sons and a daughter and Joseph brings the entire family down to Egypt where we start the first of a recurring phenomenon that's going to happen in Jewish history which we call Galut. What's the meaning of the word Galut? Exile. What's exile in Hebrew? Galut. Galut. The proto-historical period is really divisible into three. I'm going to do those three parts, and, I, and, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that in doing that I will show you something about the historical arc, because it's very important. 
I'm going to I'm just going to put in some centuries because I want to um, so we're going minus 1500 minus 1400 that helps me orient things a little bit everything in this period is a little bit conjectural speak to scholars of this period some people will put the Exodus from Egypt later, some were put it earlier, all of these things. We don't have any direct evidence for it, despite however many uh, people on the fringes of the internet who are running around Wisconsin claiming that they know where things are in relation to the Exodus from Egypt, notwithstanding, we don't have that evidence yet. And so some of it is conjectural, but based on what we know, because we are entering into the proto-historical and we can work out a range of different environmental and archaeological issues backgrounding all of these events, we can, and because we have the genealogies to some extent provided in the Bible itself, we can conjecture that the exile in Egypt uh, would have gone to approximately here. So we are, in fact, a minority class enslaved within Egyptian society. And we could talk at length. I mean, we've given talks separately on just about all of these topics. So we could go into, if we wanted, about exactly when in the Egyptian dynasties uh, and, and, and in the rise and falls of the various Egyptian dynasties the, and which pharaohs the exodus happened or the enslavement happened and the exodus happened. But it is a bit conjectural. And then we are obviously taken out of Egypt. God takes us out of Egypt and brings us towards the promised land. And entering and occupying the promised land is the third phase. So this is already the land of Israel. And here we are definitively in the proto-historic. So it's this period here that is ultimately transitional between these two phases, which, I mean, you have to understand, no other nation has this. We have a documented arc that takes us from the depths of the theo-historical into objective history. No other nation has this. And when I said, and everybody over there, especially you in South Africa, can calm down. When I said that we don't have evidence for the exodus from Egypt, I mean, of course, we don't have archaeological or historical evidence. But we do have a deep and profound evidence, which is our own existence. We are tem a dai, says Hashem. You are my witnesses. The Jewish people are witnessing that they came out of this enslavement in Egypt. In our very existence today, it's predicated upon that fact. So when we talk about evidence, there are different types. But historical evidence we don't, but living evidence we do. But it's this period here that is the transition between here and here, between the theohistorical and the definitively proto-historical. And that, of course, <laughs> if we were to identify what sits here it is of course sorry it is of course the life and career of Moses Moshe and Moses is a phenomenally pivotal figure in Jewish history in whichever way we could identify him because he has two fundamental roles within this period he is on the one hand a redeemer he's charged with the mission of leading the people of israel the children of israel the children of jacob jacob's alternate name was israel the children of israel who had become the 12 tribes of israel leading them out of egypt and towards the promised land but he is not just a redeemer he is also uniquely a lawgiver, which means that at some point here, the Jewish people laid the foundations of their spiritual identity. Now, that's a complex topic, the giving of the Torah, when exactly it happened, how it happened. 
I'm not going into that now, but if we were to understand that as a historical event in some form, then it would have happened right in the centre of this transition. That's Mount Sinai. But by the time we get to here... Just watching the time. Oh, that's good. That's good. I started at eight. We're good. We're good. We're good. By the time we get to here... Uh, we are, this is a sub-period, really, of this phase. I mean, if this phase, if that's called avot, if, that, if people are scared of theohistorical, and they call that avot, then I would probably call this period the period of amamut, the period of becoming a nation, the physical lifting out from Egypt and a return to the land promised to the avot, uh, is the formation of a nation, its identity, its spiritual uh, push, if you like, into history, which is the Torah, and the reclaiming of its ancestral home to have an identity in the world. And that is why this period is called Kibush Aretz, or the conquering of the land. And this period is so foundational for our understanding, not only of the history of the time and the history of, of the biblical history in general, but even the history of our own time. There are so many uncanny similarities between this period of fluidity during the occupation of the land. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but or if you could imagine a generation that goes back to the land of Israel to claim its ancestral birthright, only to find that there's a lot of people living around there that are not particularly happy with that idea. This is not a period of centralized leadership. Moses was, but that's a very transitional phase. I mean, li literally, physically transitional, because even according to the biblical narrative, the narrative of the Torah, we are wandering in the desert. But once we are settled, we still do not have any centralized administration. There is a loose confederacy of the 12 tribes. They are settling various... This is the biblical narrative. They are settling various parts of the land, of what was before previously known as the land of Canaan, which is now going to become the land of Israel. And they're helping each other out where they can, but ultimately it's each tribe for their own. There are very few cases where they actually band together to deal with local problems, yet there is no central administration. If there is a crisis, and the crisis generally meant a military crisis, if there was a crisis, some hero would pop up, whether that was Devorah or Gideon or Samson or whoever it might be, would pop up, deal with the crisis, and then basically go back to the farm and retire. They weren't interested in setting up dynasties. This was very much a form of anarchic syndicalism. Perhaps even, in a sense an idealization of what the Torah wanted. We know that because by the time we get to the end of this period, where the tribes start clamoring for that central administration and they want a king, the great prophet of the age, Samuel, I'll talk about in a moment, Samuel advises them against it. It's important to realize that this, <laughs> there are several issues happening in the background of world events that are causing this, the land of Israel at this time to become a crucible of human development. And we know from school, and we've all learnt about it, that of course this age is contemporary with what? The end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. This is the rise of the Iron Age. That is, that a people not far from us, the Hittites, have worked out how to... They've literally broken open the technology on how to crank up an oven so that they can smelt iron at about 800 degrees Celsius and they can form it into shapes. And they, if you have access to that technology and you have access to iron ore, then you can very, very quickly equip armies used to be the case people thought that it was simply a case that an iron sword was stronger than a bronze sword, but that's not necessarily the case. What is the advantage with iron is its ability to manufacture very quickly once you work out how to do it. 
And uh, the other thing we need to know about this era, and I'm not saying the two are connected, but I'm intimating it, is that we know that in this couple of centuries here, there was a way, there was a complete collapse of society right across the Fertile Crescent, <coughs> from Mesopotamia right through to Egypt. There was a collapse of existing social and political structures, known by historians, <coughs> by some historians, as the catastrophe, which created huge vacuums. Into those vacuums, new nations were formed. One of whom went on to become, uh, I mean, <laughs> and on the subject of the catastrophe, by the way, we don't know for sure, but to me at least, it seems that the invention of iron and iron technology and a new form of warfare being contemporary with this wave of destruction, I can't see that as just a coincidence. I'm sure there must have been a link, but other historians go into environmental issues and so on. What we need to realize is that during this entire period, we do not have iron. And the Bible tells us that specifically in a tremendously accurate reflection of what we know. We do not have iron. And also we know from the proto-historical background, we know that some of these waves of destruction, we can actually see them. If you go to Hatzor, you can see them at that level. There are many, many different ways in which the narrative of Tanakh during this period is formed. But eventually, when we get to here, and here we have another hugely transitional figure, the prophet Samuel, who is in the prophetic tradition of Moshe. And he oversees the transition to a centralized administration, a kingship. And we get the first king of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, whose name was Shaul, Saul. And I always point out to those who are not as familiar with the Tanakh as perhaps they could be, that <laughs> Saul, of course, was an astonishing choice from an astonishing tribe, because just a few couple of generations before, the entire tribe of Benjamin had virtually been wiped out in a civil war where all the other tribes basically ganged up to eliminate it. So the fact that the first king comes from the remnant of that tribe is an astonishing irony of Tanakh, of course. But it is here, in this third period, that I'm going to have to spend some very intense minutes on. Because here is, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to lower it a bit because it's a bit, I want, I'll, I'll, I want some more room. So this is minus 1,000 and this is minus 500. So let's go 900, 800. Okay, cool. Because, obviously, here, we're going to get the immensely overwhelming figure. Another, in a way, transitional figure, but also a very pivotal figure. The figure of David, King David, who is not from Benjamin, because Saul lost the crown to Benjamin. And uh, a young shepherd boy from the tribe of Judah called David rises to become not only the king of Judah, but he rises to become the king of a united kingdom of Israel. And he effectively, uh, well, <laughs> very good, David, because you reminded me of the point that I was in the middle of five minutes ago. And I will now come back to it because now it makes sense. I was talking about the period of Kibbush Aretz. I'm talking about the catastrophe. And I was saying that there is a vacuum in which many nations were born. And perhaps the most significant of those for our purposes and certainly for the biblical narrative is a new nation that arose that was composed of people that had come from the Aegean areas and Phoenicia and also some of uh, local Canaanite tribes had banded together to create a new society called Philistia that was based in Gaza. The uh, Philistines conducted their entire society politically according to a pentapolis, five major cities, quite a warlike nation, but were competing with the nascent nation of Israel for the limited resources of the land. I don't know if you could imagine uh, what that would look like, that scenario of two different people struggling for the one uh, 
uh, piece of land, one centred in the hinterland and one centred in the southwest in Gaza. But David really, after all of this back and forth with the Philistines that eventually ultimately cost Saul his kingship, uh, it wasn't until the rise of David and the, uh, under the tribe of Judah that that project uh, was able to be put to rest because from David onwards, from the next few hundred years really, our, well, next couple of hundred years, our main turmoil is internal. The Davidic kingdom managed to put a stop to, uh, they, they basically ended the Philistines and all the other smaller nations that were trying to emerge in the forest. Uh, and Judah rose up under King David, who is immensely pivotal, not only for that, but because David establishes, perhaps if we're zooming over at this level, the one thing that we would see would be that David, who has his own covenant with God, by the way, a covenant that suggests that a descendant of David would always sit on the throne of Judah. And it is that covenantal relationship that his family has in a kingly sense with God that really gives rise to the whole idea of the Messiah, or at least it's blended into the idea of the Messiah that's going to emerge throughout Jewish history. But if David did one pivotal thing that we have to talk about, it would be the fact that in a roundabout, the, in the early stages of his career here, he conquered and established the city of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And importantly, David did not just make Jerusalem the political capital, but he also made it the spiritual capital, the religious capital. There are three great strands of authority and power and influence that are flowing through the whole of the biblical narrative. That is the concept of the king, the concept of the priest, and the concept of the prophet. David combined those two in Jerusalem in a masterstroke that, because uh, there was going to be not a separation, there was now going to be a complete welding of church and state, and they were both going to be identifiable, uh, identified with Jerusalem. The temple was going to be there, it wasn't going to be anywhere else. The king was going to be based there, he wasn't going to be based anywhere else. And David's son, King Solomon, who will call Shlomo, otherwise it says David Solomon on the board, looks a bit disconcerting. And we will, and of course, he builds the temple and launches this 500 year phase, which is called by whether you are in religious discourse or in academic discourse, you are going to call everything that happens in this 500 year phase, you are going to call what? Bayit Rishon. Bayit You're going to call it the first temple. Very original names we have. First temple. Now, in the next five minutes, I want to give this arc because we're doing the historical arc of Tanakh. I'm going to show where all the books sit in a moment, but the historical arc is very important and I'm going to kind of try and uh, make this comprehensible because for some people it gets complex, but it's not actually that complex once you realise what's going on, if you can see it graphically. King Solomon rules over a united kingdom. He has a spiritual and political capital. He has an army. He has a vast administration. He is the dude. He is ruling over vast tracts of territory. He is, is a strong and stable and secure kingdom. But he has some issues. And now is not the time to go into those issues, but it so happens that after King Solomon dies, this united kingdom that had held together during his father's reign and even during King Saul's reign tentatively, but this united kingdom split. And it split into two. In the north, 
drawing this box in the approximate length of its duration. In the north, we find the kingdom of Israel comprising 10 of the tribes that split away to form their own kingdom. They very soon established their own capital in Samaria and so on. And the remaining two tribes, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, both of which had produced kings, in the south created the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, <laughs> they are parallel for the first couple of centuries until the kingdom of Israel is eventually vanquished. During this time, they vary in their approach to one another, sometimes at war, sometimes ignoring each other, sometimes at peace, sometimes cooperating, but they are parallel, but they have to some extent slightly different historical arcs. And so I'm going to focus, first of all, on the northern kingdom of Israel. And we're only looking at the absolute pinpoint things that we can see from this distance because the details are many. There are many, many great, amazing stories and people that we can't talk about right now, but we're looking at a very, very wide arc. And that is that the story in the north, because they didn't have something as stable as the Davidic kingdom, so basically whoever was decided that they were going to be king next week would get up with their favourite weapon, kill the king, and if no one opposed them, they would be the king. And we have to actually wait quite a few generations until we, until we get some stable dynasties in the north. The first basically stable dynasty is the House of Omri. And we know the House of Omri not only from the Tanakh itself, but we know the House of Omri because we see Omri and other northern kings depicted on the stella of the Assyrians and the Egyptians and other countries around. So we know already some of the northern kings are in objective history in the way that the Tanakh tells us. But the story in the northern kingdom overall is tragic. And here we can't, even though we are on the historical arc, we can't avoid the themes <laughs> that are emerging in Tanakh. Because if Tanakh has a theme throughout this entire historical arc, it's this, without which, I mean, it's a bit like, it's a bit like understanding the narrative arc of a film without realizing its point. I mean, at some, at some level, you have to get the point to get the arc. And the point is this. God creates a covenant with some special people. Their descendants go into exile. They come out of exile and they are given a spiritual mandate and they are given to build the ideal society and they are given a place to do it and they are assisted in settling themselves over this couple of centuries in this land. But they do it conscious of all of the warnings that came in the spiritual mandate. And the warnings were this. If you're going to set up this ideal society, it must be founded above anything else on social justice. It must be a righteous and kind society. You must look after the oppressed, the widows, the orphans, the disadvantaged, the depressed, the handicapped, the confused, the alienated. The gap between rich and poor should never become too great because when it does, you find one half of the society is exploiting the other. You should value these foundations of justice and righteousness as your primary value and above all, obviously, the dignity of the human being, above all other values and not prioritize over them values of exploitation and greed and injustice. There's a very, very... If you don't understand that, then you haven't understood really what the Bible's talking about. And what we see in this period in the Northern Kingdom is the gradual but inexorable degradation of social justice values, precisely in the opposite direction that the Torah is mandating. That is why this period is the rise of the great prophets. 
the whole transformation of the concept of God and society that arises in the prophetic era here, and we're going to talk about that in a few moments, happens as this kingdom and this society is becoming more and more steeped in iniquity. And that is also coincident, coincident with, contemporary with, the rise of a massive new power. A power that <laughs> this world has not seen before. Because they are an empire with new military and other technologies and cohesive force that is a tsunami in history. And that is the rise of the first <coughs> of the truly great global empires in scope, the Neo-Assyrians. And as the Neo-Assyrians, I mean, they didn't call themselves the Neo-Assyrians, we do, because really they're a re-rising of earlier Assyrian cultures, as we discussed. And as the Assyrians are on the ascendant, they're effectively the Northern Kingdom's closest trading partner. And they are making the Northern Kingdom very wealthy and very successful. But there is, of course, no equal distribution of that wealth. And it became an end in itself. And once you open up to the economic whoredom that was happening with the Neo-Assyrians, then you're going to open yourself up to its spiritual values as well. You are going to buy into its picture of the divine. You're going to buy into its avodah zarah, into its idol worship. And where you have idol worship, you have social injustice. And where you have social injustice, you have idol worship because they are two sides of the same coin, which is the pursuit of power. And we have always had a problem with power. One major figure who I have to mention in the historical arc phase who doesn't have their own book, and in a few minutes we're going to go and we're going to show all the books of the Tanakh and where they sit on this historical picture. But one figure who really encapsulates the transformative rise of the prophets, and he doesn't have his own book, but he's running around here in the Northern Kingdom uh, towards the end of the Omri dynasty, and that of course is Elijah the prophet. And as I always point out to people, Elijah the prophet in the Bible is not some warm, fuzzy guy with a beard that you, meets you on street corners at night and whispers secrets in your ear and comes to your Seder table and has a bit of wine and is it your Brit Mila and so on. The Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet in the Bible, is a hairy, scary guy who basically zaps anyone who comes within 50 meters of him because he is so consumed with the divine zeal and divine anger at this entire arrangement of social injustice. And eventually, eventually, the little kitten of Assyria becomes a lion and it swallows and it eats and it devours and it spits out. And the Assyrians came and in minus 720, they completely vanquished the northern kingdom, and they took the ten tribes away. The Neo-Assyrians were very big into ethnic cleansing. They didn't just take you away from your ancestral lands, they replaced you with other peoples who took them from their ancestral lands. We've seen this through various times in history that various rulers do this. The Assyrians found that very effective. And that's the end. So what comes after here is really now Jewish history. Judah, Judaism, Jewish. Up until now, this is the history of greater Israel. But we are the remnant of Israel now. And the kingdom of Judah is going to chug on. Now, what's been happening in Judah? Much more stable because of the Davidic line. So you knew in any generation who was likely to become king. It wasn't a complete anarchy like it was in the north for much of the time. 
we don't actually have that many really good kings. We have some great kings, some powerful kings, but if we're looking at the vantage point that we're looking at, then we're just going to be able to look really at two after King David and King Solomon. There's really two who are pivotal that you would need to know about, and one of them comes in right here, and that, of course, is King Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah is the king at the time of the destruction of the northern kingdom, and he sees it. And it is at that time, only, only a couple of decades later, that the Neo-Assyrians come back and they come back to capture and obliterate the kingdom of Judah. And in around the year 700, that's what they did. They ravaged the entire land. But they couldn't take Jerusalem. They never took it. If you look at a map, if you look at a digital map today of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, its greatest expansion, there's one little pixel in the middle there that's not the colour of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. That's Jerusalem. Had they taken Jerusalem, then that would have been it. That would have been the end. No more Jewish history, no more Judaism, no more me standing here. But they didn't. This was a miraculous moment and a huge turning point. Hezekiah's and we're going to come back to that because it's around that event that we start to see the whole positioning of the prophetic tradition. Because Hezekiah did something else with his career. Something that a lot of people don't realise hadn't really been done until Hezekiah. I mean, he rebuilt the walls, he expanded Jerusalem. We, we have archaeological evidence still from him. He was a real, actual, objective, historical king. But he did something else. Where is his ancestor David? had united the monarchy and the priesthood, in a sense, when I say united, brought them to Jerusalem to act as one, Hezekiah brought the third strand in and made Jerusalem the centre of prophecy. His relationship with the prophet Isaiah meant that from here, what's the famous verse in Isaiah? If you don't, you, you don't need to read any more than chapter 2 of Isaiah. By the way, by the way, I didn't say this at the beginning. The Bible, the Tanakh, and I'll probably, I'll leave this for in a few minutes when I go, I'll, I'll say something else about it, but it's, it's written in Hebrew. And you have to understand the Jewish people's love affair with the Hebrew language that has gone on for thousands of years is a testament to the sublime nature of the texts that we're talking about. Read chapter 2 of Isaiah and he'll tell you and a verse that you are very familiar with. Because the Torah will go out of Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. When before that do we have prophets who base themselves in Jerusalem? But from here onwards, Hezekiah managed to make it the capital, the political capital, the religious capital and the spiritual capital. The transformative capital. Because at the end of the day, the prophetic project is transformative. Then we would also want to look at Hezekiah's great-grandson, Josiah, who is here. Another righteous king. Very few righteous kings, Hezekiah and Josiah. But Josiah is living in a slightly different phase of history because when Josiah is living, the, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, this unstoppable force, is now in deep decline. It's no longer got huge rulers like Ashurbanipal and so on. It's imploding from within and it is being usurped by the new power in the region, the big uh, bad uh, Babylonians, Babylon. And while the Neo-Assyrian Empire is imploding and before the Babylonians really come on the scene, Josiah is one of a number of rulers, together with Egypt and so on, who are trying to muscle for room moving forward into the next phase of history. Josiah actually dies in that attempt, killed by Nahor, the pharaoh of Egypt, as he's making his way up to help the last staggering remains of the Neo-Assyrian Empire against the unstoppable Babylonian onslaught, which eventually happens in the famous Battle of Carchemish. We've spoken about that and so on. And so it's Josiah's sons that, and for the most part, his grandson, who are going to stagger Judah towards its inevitable end. Because the Babylonians come several times, and on the final time, in minus 586, they come. 
and they destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And that is massive. That's a huge psychotrauma for the Jewish people. This is not a building that was ever meant to be destroyed. This was an eternal building. But we'll talk about this more when we talk about the prophets, because as the prophets of Israel were saying to the sons of Josiah who led Judah up to the Babylonian destruction, the Babylonians are coming. And who do you think is at the head of the Babylonian army? God. It is God that is causing, simply using Babylon as an agent to destroy the temple. And we have brought that on ourselves. We have become very, very used to this kind of victim culture today. And we write letters to the, to the AJN and we complain about this and that. But ultimately, when we're talking about this level of cosmic and real history, it was the behaviour of the societies in the, and the values they prioritised and the ones they didn't that caused this destruction. Then, of course, only a couple uh, minutes more on this arc, then I'm going to do the book very quickly, because now that we've laid down the arc, then, of course, we have another galut. What's the meaning of galut? Exile. exile. What's exile in Hebrew? Galut. Very good. And, of course, this is the famous galut Babel. This is the exile in Babylon. And then, remarkably... That just seemed to dissipate overnight as prophesied by Jeremiah back here on the eve of the destruction. He said it would last 70 years and indeed it did. Because here Cyrus, the ruler of Persia, gets up, he schmeisses Babylon and he decrees that nations can go back to the lands where they had been displaced in the last century or two and rebuild their cultures and their sacred institutions and we came back under the decree of Cyrus and we set up the second temple period which is where I started this series and the Bible narrative arc basically takes us up to here a bit after a couple of generations after Cyrus the Persians are in control the arrival of Ezra and Nehemiah and so on to rebuild uh, Jerusalem and its social, political, religious and spiritual foundations and to start effectively what is going to start looking like Judaism as we know it and that ends the biblical period. So that is the historical arc and now in the next few minutes I'm going to go through all the books of Tanakh and we're going to show exactly where they sit and I know that there are probably other pe people on the other side of that camera now who are screaming and throwing things at me saying, oh, you haven't got this. Well, you try and do this. And I'm very open to discussion if anyone wants to disagree with me. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Tanakh, which is what the Jewish people call their most sacred document, the Bible, is really an acronym, which stands, as you know, for Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, which we call the five books of Moses. You don't get the Torah named after you unless you're someone very, very special in Jewish history. And that's the pivotal nature of Moshe. He is very special. And that's the first five books of Moses. The N of Tanakh stands for Nevi'im. Historical books and the books of the prophets themselves, which we're going to show. And the K of Tanakh, or the K of Tanakh, is Ketuvim which are all the other writings that don't fit into the first two categories. They're sacred writings and we'll show where they sit historically. And when I say where they sit historically, some of these texts we're not entirely sure. We're not entirely sure. You can jump up and down as much as you like, but we're not entirely sure when they were composed. We have traditions about them, but I want to highlight where we would project them historically. But let's start with the Torah. The first book of the Bible, the first book of the, of the Torah is, of course, the book of Bereshit, the book of Genesis. We don't need to call it Genesis. It has a perfectly good name in Hebrew, Bereshit. And the word Bereshit means in the beginning. And the book is about beginnings. It's about the beginning of the world. And it's about the beginning of Jewish history and the beginning of the Jewish people. And the beginning of a unique family that's going to go on to make the Jewish people. I have to say this because I know people will be wondering. I'm start Jewish history with Abraham. 
I'm f I have read the book of Bereshit once or twice. And I am aware that prior to Avraham, there is some very dense and interesting material about the origins of the universe. And that is all fine. But it's not technically Jewish history. It might be a Jewish perspective on history. But do I need to remind people that Noah is running around with a foreskin and everybody before Abraham is a human. And so with full respect to everybody or the generations living before Abraham, I'm starting here because that also fits neatly into our paradigm. Abraham comes from Mesopotamia uh, in search of the land that God is giving him. But everything up to here, up to Joseph, as you know, that entire book, that entire span of the theo-historical period or of the Avot is covered in the book of Bereshit, in the book of Genesis. The second book of the Torah, of course, is the book of Exodus, and that's going to cover everything from the exile in Egypt right up to the deliverance from Egypt by God under the administration of Moses. I'm going to, I'll, I'll use the English term, that's Exodus, we know it as Sefer Shmot. And that includes also not just the deliverance from Egypt, but it also includes monumental moments such as the giving of the Torah, the cataclysm of rebellion that happened around the worship of the golden calf immediately after, and the construction of a sanctuary that is going to become the proto-sanctuary that's going to go forward in Jewish history, that's going to become the temple and so on. All of that happens in the book of Exodus. It's a very busy book. And then in this period here, really, in the latter half of Moses' career, for want of trying to find a reconciliation of the many, many different opinions on how this works, we can place the books of Leviticus, which deals with mostly with the priestly laws of sacrifices and purity and impurity, the book of uh, Bamidbar, and I don't want to call it numbers because I never like the word numbers. I mean, what's a, it's got a perfectly good name, Bamidbar. And what is the meaning of Bamidbar? In the desert. And where does Bamidbar take place? In the desert. And what's Bamidbar about? In the desert. So it is the wanderings of that generation in the desert, Bamidbar, or Bamidbar, uh, where they basically undergo and experience everything that any Jewish community. Uh, is likely to face. It is re a phenomenal focus on leadership, looking at the many, many different nuances and aspects of leadership from the point of view of Moses and his brother Aaron as they try to take these people towards the land of Israel. And then, just before Moses leaves and departs this world, he um, recites the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Devarim, which is a... Um, revision of the, the main principles, not only of what's happened to this point, but all the foundations of social justice going forward. That's the Teh of Torah. The Ne of Nevi'im. The Ne of Nevi'im starts with the very next historical phase, because the person who succeeds Moses and takes the Jewish people into the land of Israel is, of course, the figure of Joshua. Joshua, Joshua. Joshua. Just as an aside, because I know that people will be watching this at some point, and they may as well, I may as well say this as my opinion. I've said it elsewhere, but sometimes uh, it's worth explicating it further, even though I don't really have time to say this. But I find the book of Joshua, perhaps, the most difficult book of the Tanakh to teach for our generation because it's a very difficult book for us to relate to. There are, but it's basically the people of Israel are uh, reading the land of Israel of, of paganism and idolatry, but they're doing it in a way that I, I don't think that the, um, the Hague would like. And... Uh, all of the books of the Bible are able to be reconciled with modern values in some way, uh, but we're still working on the book of Joshua. It is an, a fascinating book archaeologically, and certainly if you're into battles and so on, I've looked very much at the book of Joshua from that perspective, and it has some enlightening spiritual moments that are uh, very uh, inspiring, but um, <laughs> it's a difficult book. But after Joshua, uh, we have this... <laughs> immensely 
underappreciated but just phenomenally fascinating book uh, of the book of Sefer Shoftim, the book of Judges, which it is unbelievable that HBO or Netflix or any of these people are not making a phenomenal, because I mean, a Game of Thrones has got nothing on the book of Judges when you go into it and everything is in there. But the central message is this, there's no one in control. Everybody's doing what they think is right. There's heroes sorting out crises, but we're lurching forward from one crisis to another. We don't seem to have a plan and we're really, really not equipped to be doing what we're meant to be doing yet. Followed by the book of Samuel. And because I know I'm speaking to an intelligent audience, I don't need to explain to you that there's only one Samuel. There is Samuel 1 and Samuel 2, but there's two different books. Originally, it was one book. They divided into one and two. But I have actually had people ask me in the past who Samuel 2 was. It's the same person as Samuel 1. But the book of Samuel 1, the editorial decision to split them was brilliant. The book of Samuel 1 deals with the, rise, with the rise of the concept of the king. It's the rise of the king, if Tolkien was to uh, have named it. And it effectively shows not only how we came together, the tribes come together to combine together to, to, to create the concept of kingship, but how that king ultimately failed. And his interactions with the prophet, his interactions with God, his interactions with the people, and his own psychological collapse uh, constitute one of the great studies of world history in leadership, in power, in abuse of power, in, uh, in psychological collapse. In, it is an astonishing profile. Every time you read it, you're just amazed how the Tanakh is able to concisely portray the depth of these characters. And then, of course, in Samuel 2, we see the rise of David. He's been competing with Saul for quite a bit of Samuel 1, but now he comes into his own right, and it is David who creates what we know as, uh, as, as the Judah, the kingdom of Judah and of Israel that is going to go through the first temple and the major structures and institutions of all that. Very, very important to realize that that moment in Samuel 2 where David is accosted by the prophet Nathan and accused of a crime against social justice is yet again a pivotal, pivotal point in the Tanakh that gives us tremendous insight into the role of the prophet. The prophet wasn't beholden to anyone but God who spoke through him or her. So the prophet could speak to kings and tell them how it is. It is a very sadly missed institution in most political structures. And despite this, David stayed on the throne, but he was, uh, it was never quite the same after that. And the book of Samuel more or less ends at the end of David's career. He goes a little bit into the next book, but he's not around there for long. And the next book, of course, is, the, is, a, is an entire arc. It's the book of Kings. It's divided into Kings 1 and Kings 2. But collectively, the book of Kings takes us from King Solomon and the building of the temple takes us all the way right through the split of the kingdom, right through the two parallel kingdoms, right past the vanquishment of the northern kingdom by the Neo-Assyrians, all the way into the rise of Babylon, all the way here, all the way into the destruction of the temple and eventually lands and ends inside the Babylonian exile. That's the entire scope and span of the book of Kings. And as we've seen, the major figures that it contains and it once again it jumps from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom and it shows a similar story the tragedy was that judah did not learn from what happened to the northern kingdom so the books that are going to come within the Nevi'im, within the prophets after this are going to be individual books of prophets that have their own historical context within this narrative of what they're talking about but we need to understand the book of kings is all of this historical arc, and so the, the Nevi'im, the prophets that we're familiar with their names, get posted on these. And of those prophets, here's the way it works. We have three big daddy prophets, each with their own book, and 12 what are referred to sometimes, the Treas are referred to as minor prophets, but there's nothing minor about them. There's nothing minor about them. They are phenomenally sublime, lofty books. 
they're just a lot shorter than the three main books. But each of those three main big daddy prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, represent three different stages within this development. The first is Isaiah. And as I said, Isaiah is sitting here, the book of Yeshayahu is sitting contemporary with Hezekiah, contemporary with Hezekiah. So he saw, he saw what happens. Yeah? The people that were walking in darkness have seen a great light. He saw that tremendous salvation of Jerusalem, but immediately turned around and realized that the kingdom of Judah <laughs> was very fortunate because there were some deep underlying problems that he had to address. Now I'm going to talk about Isaiah for a minute because it's we need to talk about what the prophets are doing in their enormous transformative project. When I opened this series, I think if you recall, I talked about the year minus 500 as being a year where we see a lot of spiritual and intellectual transformations happening around the world and we ask ourselves oh well what happened to the transformation of the jewish people the reality is that that had happened a couple of centuries before and that is the entire prophetic transformation that we've spoken about elsewhere and all of the themes that the prophets are talking about they all emphasize different aspects of those themes but they are all contained in full form in the book of Yeshayahu, in the book of isaiah which is so sublime, uh, and, and which, of course, uh, I think it's David Ben-Gurion who famously said, if you read the book of Isaiah in any other language other than Hebrew, it's like kissing a beautiful woman through a handkerchief. And the reality is, is that if you're fortunate enough to learn a little bit of Hebrew, not a lot, just a little bit, to engage with that text, that source, it's phenomenal. But let's talk about it thematically. Everything I'm about to say can, pertains to all the prophets, but it's particularly the case in Isaiah. The first thing we need to realize is the great transformation that's going to happen is that Isaiah is going to let us understand thoroughly, as do all the other prophets, <coughs> the universalization of the God of Israel. That the God of Israel is not simply a God, some local deity in the land of Israel. That in fact, God is a universal concept and God demands justice and righteousness from all nations, for which particularly the nation of Israel is to set an example, and that is the main conduit of God's message into the world, but all the nations will come to recognize God. God, and this is the really big one, God is not some kind of neutral force that I can manipulate through prayer, worship, or magic to do what I need God to do for me. <laughs> That's what the pagan thinks. God demands justice and righteousness and moral and ethical behavior. God never told us to be religious. I'll say that again. God never told us to be religious. God told the people of Israel to be holy. And God told, told the people of Israel to love one another and to be kind and just and righteous. Doesn't matter how many sacrifices I bring. Doesn't matter how religious I am. If I don't prioritize social justice, we have to keep the mitzvot. You can't just prioritize social justice and do it. You, we, there is an entire spiritual program for the Jewish people but it's predicated on righteousness. And the prophets, such as Isaiah, are also telling us that <laughs> when I realize that, I can transform myself. An inner transformation, which we call the concept of teshuvah, the concept of, loosely translated as repentance, but it really means teshuvah, the concept of return, which is a transformative moment that happens inside myself. I transform myself. I transform those around me. I transform those around me. I transform my community. I transform my community. I transform the world. And if we transform the world, then we will arrive at the other great idea that the prophets of Israel are giving us, the concept of the Messianic age. And when Isaiah 
chastises and rebukes the people of Israel, he always does it by pointing to their greatest potential. That chapter 2 that I spoke about earlier, that's a classic example. He starts by saying to the people of Israel, one day, people of Israel, all the nations in the world will stream to your house of worship to seek your counsel and advice. Your tragedy is, is that you don't realize that and you are not living up to that picture. Which is the ultimate way in which to speak to someone that you're chastising. You have such tremendous potential, but you're not living up to it. All of that is in Isaiah. I can't talk more about Isaiah. Obviously, we have to move on. I've got about 15 minutes to do all the other books of the Bible, but it's hugely important. The other big daddy prophet. So we've got three. One is Isaiah. Then here, from the reign of Josiah and his sons and his descendants who take us to the end of the, of the Judean kingdom in the first temple, is, of course, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Yirmiyahu is a very, very different book. It is a, an emotional roller coaster. Perhaps more than any other text, gives us a deep insight into the career and feelings and sense of a prophet, what he goes through. Because Jeremiah is told, he's not coming to warn the people of Israel. <laughs> it's too late. The iniquities that have been built up are too great. He's coming to tell them, that if they change their behavior now, they might just survive it. Go to chapter 7, go to chapter 26 of the book of Jeremiah, and you will see the crux of Yeremiah's argument. You think that because you have the temple and because you have territorial integrity, therefore God has some kind of obligation to save you and keep you in this land. <laughs> but staying in this land is not about territorial integrity or the fact that you have the temple. You can't give away the land of Israel. The land of Israel is taken away. And it's taken away because of your behavior. This is a very, very powerful and difficult to listen to messages from a Navi that was sitting on the eve of destruction. And on the eve of that destruction, Jeremiah himself went and bought a plot of field near Jerusalem because he knew that they would come back. Which was an unbelievable idea at the time. And the third big prophet, um, I mean, I have to move on from Yirmiyahu because otherwise we could get lost there. And the third big daddy prophet, of course, is after the destruction inside the Babylonian exile. And that, of course, is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is, apart from uh, hugely trippy, but it, it, it is astonishing because it is really the, 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 the voice and message of God being heard from in the depths of the exile. They didn't know what they were supposed to do when they got to Babylon. They didn't even know if God could hear them from there. Ezekiel's perception of the divine chariot from the depths of exile is a huge testament to the universalization of God and the promise of what was to come and the vision of the rebuilt kingdom of Israel that would be a light for all the nations. An idea that, of course, Isaiah had talked about and so on, but Ezekiel gives it full imaginative perspective. And more than imaginative, because we base a lot of our understanding of what will be in the third temple from the book of Ezekiel. Now, <coughs> once we understand where these three big daddy prophets are sitting, then we can, all of the other minor prophets, so-called minor prophets, can fit as a cluster around them. So, for example, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, okay, I've got to move fast. Chronologically, chronologically, the first of the great prophets is actually in the northern kingdom, sitting here during the time of, you know, the Assyrian ascendancy where things are very successful and good in the north, but terribly iniquitous. And that, of course, is the prophet Amos. And he is followed fairly soon after by the prophet Hosea. Actually, the, obviously, when you open the Tanakh, you'll see that Hosea is listed before Amos. And that's because Hosea was regarded by the sage of Israel as perhaps the most sublime prophet in his expression. And we'll get on to that in a second. Amos start is the first to make the very, very politically incorrect statement that the northern kingdom is going to be destroyed. That just wasn't something they wanted to hear in the northern kingdom. Hosea, once again, sublime, just 
immensely deep read, but shows us also that the prophets were not simply microphones, as Avram Yeshua Heschel famously said. They were people, and their life was a message. It wasn't just what they said, it's how they lived, it's what they did. And sometimes they were given performance pieces. Ezekiel was given huge performance pieces, installation art, literally. And Hosea was told that he had to find the most promiscuous woman he could find and marry her. She, of course, leaves him, comes back, leaves him, comes back. His entire life became relationship with his wife became a metaphor for the relationship between God and Israel. The, uh, there's, now, there are a few books in the Bible that we really, really find it difficult to date. One of them sits in the Tanakh. When you open it, you'll see, and that's the book of Yoel. We don't really know where it goes, but because it speaks very profoundly of the theme of teshuva, of return, of repentance, but from an inner, not outward repentance, not fasting and all the rest of it, but inner deep transformation, that sits thematically here. So they put it between those two books. And there is another book we also don't know where to place, and that's the shortest of all the prophets. It's one chapter book called Ovadia. Now, the rabbis tell us that Ovadia was a companion. Well, we know from Tanakh there was a companion of Elijah called Ovadia. And the rabbis said, oh, that's the same Ovadia. So we don't know where else to put him. It, it's a, the book of Ovadia is about the destruction. It's a prophecy about the destruction of Edom. And Edom, as you know, is at the southeast of the land of Israel. Uh, and so there are suggestions that maybe it might be alluding to later events. But in the absence of anything else, we'll go with the rabbis and we'll put it here. Then, of course, we have a book that we all know about, which is the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah. And that, of course, is very explicitly there. It's in that period during Jeroboam II, uh, the, uh, where things are very good in the northern kingdom. And Jonah is sent out to prophesy repentance to another nation. Showing once again the universalization of God that is happening in this entire transformation here. Uh, and also remarkably because through that repentance, on the surface at least, the Assyrians are then going to go on and become the agent of the northern kingdom's destruction itself. And it's a very simple book. It's got four chapters. One's in a boat, a first chapter in a boat, second chapter in a fish, third chapter in a city, and the fourth chapter on a hill outside the city. And once again shows the complexity, the psychological complexity of the prophet in his relationship with God and his message. It's not all simple sail uh, plain sailing. It is a very, very complex thing to be a prophet. And when you read it with that, first of all, with historical context, but also, and that explains why Jonah ran away, of course. He didn't want to be that conduit. Uh, when you understand their context and their psychological makeup, the book starts taking on different dimensions. Then we have the prophet uh, Micha, and Micha is a contemporary, a younger contemporary of Isaiah, and he's like, uh, he's like the whole book of Yeshayahu in seven short chapters, turbo on crack, and basically reflecting a similar message, although the famous, uh, incredibly famous verses in, in Micha, which sum up the entire prophetic project, when he says, you know, what does God want? Does God want the sacrifices? Does he want all the worship? Does he want all the religious devotions? No. He's already told you, man, what's good. And what he asks from you. Yeah? Do justice. Loving kindness. And walk humbly with your God. That's it. That's the prophetic essence. Then we have a book called the Book of Nahum. Not that well known. And interestingly enough, Nahum is pretty much the only book that survives from this particular era here. After Hezekiah, the kingdom of Judah had some particularly evil kings who wiped out all opposition and all prophetic messages. But the book of Nahum survives. And the book of Nahum is talking in the first chapter about the destruction of Assyria, in the second chapter about the destruction of Assyria, and in the third chapter about the destruction of Assyria. It's about the destruction of Assyria. And the destruction of Assyria, when it comes, uh, eventually, obviously, reflects highly with the prophecies that were made in the book of Nahum. Then we have a cluster of prophets around Jeremiah. And uh, famously, we have uh, Habakkuk and Sophania, who are in similar times. They're on the eve of the destruction. It's all doom and gloom. And there are great dark clouds gathering on the horizon. But they are distracted by some very deep <laughs> theological and philosophical issues. Habakkuk realizes that the Babylonians aren't exactly tzaddikim. They're not exactly righteous. They're going to come and they're not going to differentiate between the good and the bad. They're going to kill everyone. How come this punishment is going to come on everyone and everyone's going to die because of it? 
It's a very big question. It ends off with our understanding that God works in a huge cosmic picture and at the end of the day in here, in this world, tzaddik be'emonato yichyeh, that from here onwards, the righteous person is going to live as an exemplar of their faith. It's no longer going to... But, but, but Habakkuk is also a deep exploration of the concept of tyranny. It's a book really that should be read today again, that societies which are tyrannical have already sowed the seeds of their own destruction. And that is the same for us as well. Uh, but but, but the, con- the link between, between righteousness as an embodiment of faith is something that emerges very much from this later part of the prophetic project and through Habakkuk. And Sophania is looking also at the concept of exile. Can exile, which is inevitable, have a quality that refines and redeems the people of Israel so that they can be better placed going forward into history? Even exile has a divine purpose. Then there is the destruction, and then there is the exile, and then there is the decree of Cyrus, and then we come back and we have a last final cluster of prophets right at this period of the very beginning of the second temple. They're actually the ones who set up the foundations of it. And they are, of course, Haggai and his companion Zechariah. And we know that we came back with under Zerubbabel ben Shaltiel, the grandson of the last king, and Yehoshua ben Yehotzadak, the grandson of the last high priest. And they came back, they led this. We read in yesterday's Haftarah, the whole concept of the Menorah and so on, the revival of the Second Temple period, and that there was tremendous spiritual optimism. But they had to kick the people along a little bit. They had to get them because they had to make them realize that there is a balance. Yes, I know that the temple was destroyed because we overemphasized it religiously, but you still need it. You still need a spiritual center in your social existence. It just needs to be in balance with your economy. And your economy needs to be in balance with your spiritual center. And Zachariah, once again, a very trippy book, ecstatic, very revealed, um, just taking it to another level of revealed prophecy. Uh, many of, of those passages people are seeing today and saying that they can see events. But uh, if we do a pesher on, on Zachariah, uh, there would be no end. All right. And then we have one prophet who comes... Uh, right at the end of the prophetic project, and that, of course, is Malachi in the next generation. In fact, some people even think that Malachi is Ezra, that they might have been uh, an identical person. I can tell you if some chazofressing professor in Germany in the 19th century had said that, they would have gone, ah, oh, Picrusus, but it wasn't him. It was, in fact, Chazal who said that Malachi may well be Ezra, so that opinion is, concept- uh, is acceptable. So Malachi uh, comes and he's basically telling you that... <laughs> I'm the end of prophecy. I'm the end of prophecy. It's not going to go further. The concept of nouveau as you knew it, the transformative word of God spoken directly through people is going away, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back at the end of history and it's going to come back with Elijah the prophet who started really that prophetic project. It's going to come back and it's going to reconcile generations. That beautiful end of the whole Sefer Malachi. And Malachi is telling the people, if you're going to do these acts of worship, then at least do them properly. Malachi is a huge, he's telling us to remember the laws of Moses, but he's saying do them authentically. Don't just do them pathetically because you think that that's what religion demands of you, because that's the emptiness. Do them in a way that you mean them, that you connect with them. All right, now, then, in the next three minutes, I'm going to do the Ch of Tanakh. I'm going to do the Ketuvim. All right, now we know that the first thing you'll see when you look at the Ketuvim is you'll see a great big fat book called the Book of Psalms. And Psalms are Tehillim, and Psalms are traditionally attributed to King David. However, it's very clear to anyone who looks for five minutes of the book of Psalms, you'll see that some of the Psalms there, it's very difficult to understand how David could uh, have composed them, given that they are talking about events that happen hundreds of years later. For example, the famous Shir Hama'alot, yeah? which we say before Brikat Amazon, that you all know Shir Hama'alot. Right? So that's talking about the return of the captivity of Zion, which is here. Now, okay, so on the one hand, we could say, well, David is a prophet, he's seeing it, but... It is possible, and I don't think it's too big a, 
a deal to say that some of the Psalms were written later, but certainly we know of the figure of David that he wasn't just a warrior and a king, he was also a poet and a musician, and he either wrote or commissioned many Psalms which still bear his name. Then we have, then you'll find that King, his son, King Solomon, is attributed with three books. The first of those is Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, which he wrote in his youth, say the rabbis. Then the book of Mishle, Proverbs, an immensely profound wisdom book um, of, 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 of classic biblical wisdom literature. It's, 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 it's an immense book on a world literary level, the book of Proverbs. It's got uh, infinite depths in it. And then he wrote the book of Kohelet, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, which is very kind of cynical and philosophical. There are many people who believe that the attribution of these books to King Solomon is a little bit uh, perhaps exaggerated because uh, due, the language, the ideas, Song of Songs is, as you know, is uh, 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 composed of uh, what is on the surface um, erotic love poetry, but as soon as you go below the surface, you realize it, it, why the sages of Israel told us how holy it was. It contains so much uh, sublime and be, uh, uh, um, emotive content and it became one of the core texts of Jewish mysticism. Uh, Mishle, once again, spirit, world spiritual literature in wisdom and Kohelet, once again, a philosophical text that may, looks like parts of it might have been composed later, but maybe not. I'm not going to venture into that. These are the traditional attributions of where they sit. Then we have a book that's very, very difficult to date. And yet it is, again, world, one of world literature's greatest explorations of the concept of suffering. Why do the righteous suffer? Why do good things happen to bad people? And that, of course, is the book of Eov. And I'm not going, we've done a separate talk on Eov. I'm not going into it now, but Eov is a very righteous guy. He's also very wealthy and just all at once, a heap of bad stuff happens to him. And he has to work his way out of that philosophically. And so we don't know where Eov was. The language is very difficult. The dating is very difficult. It's the hardest Hebrew in the Bible. The rabbis tell us that Eov, and, and the Talmud, by the way, gives us no less than eight opinions on when Eov lived, including the opinion that he never lived because he never existed. He's a made-up character. And that opinion was adopted by a number of later sages. But other rabbis tell us that, oh, there's a famous midrash where he was a contemporary of Moshe and Yitro and all of this, that famous midrash of him sitting around, so we'll put him there. But the likelihood is that he's possibly over here somewhere. Uh, then we are going to find the book of uh, Daniel. And Daniel is a book, Daniel's not a prophet. Daniel is a hugely inspired, spiritually infused individual, but not technically a prophet. His concerns are not the same as the concerns of the Nevi'im. Daniel sitting in the Babylonian exile as a very righteous and holy person, uh, quite concerned about the fact that it looks like that the prophecy of Jeremiah doesn't necessarily look like it's going to be fulfilled. And he basically gets told that he got his times wrong. Uh, and then he goes into a number of revelatory and ecstatic uh, passages that even Daniel tells you, I don't even know what these things mean. And every once in a while, someone will pop up and say, oh, I've cracked the code of Daniel and whatever. We don't know what Daniel will mean to the end of times. But Daniel has become an exemplar of the steadfastness of Jewish spirituality in its darkest moments and in the times of exile. It's a very important book. Then, oh, I mean, when we're talking about the five Megillots, I'm remembering we have, of course, the book of Ruth. And in a sense, whenever the book of Ruth was written, we know when it's historically set. It's set in the time of the book of Judges, because Ruth is going to go on and become the great grandmother of David. And we know that it's, and it, we know it's set in the book of Judges because it starts with the words, at the time of the Judges. So it tells us when it's set. And amazingly, amazing how the, the, the Tanakh, the Tanakh narrative manages to capture the spirit and essence of these periods of time without any real anachronism. I don't think that we could do that about a period that's hundreds of years ago on the assumption. So some of these texts must have been written very close to after the time they happened. Uh, then we have the uh, book of Eichah. 
and the book of Echa is uh, attributed to Jeremiah, it is of course a description of the destruction of the temple, the book of Lamentations, and we read that on the 9th of Av. And we have the book of Esther. Now Esther, once again, the whole story of the Megillah, the whole story of the, of the book of Esther is set, obviously, here somewhere because it's in the Persian Empire. But there is a lot of discussion about when. Is it before the building of the temple, second temple, after the building of the second temple? Who is Ahasuerosh? Is it Ataxerxes? Is it Xerxes? Is it Cambyses? Who is it? What's going on? It's also connected with some of the fault lines in Jewish historiography that we've talked about. No one has really been able to properly place Esther in a way that answers all the questions. But if you are a Jewish person with any sensitivity to Jewish history as well, and you read that text, you know that it's true. It's not historical in the way that we understand historical. And that's precisely behind the idea of Esater, that I will hide this in history. Because really, our generation is just about the only generation that can truly understand it. Because we know that there is a cycle in Jewish history that every time the Jewish people come back from a galut towards the land of Israel, they are attacked by the genocidal project of Amalek. It happened when we came out of Egypt. It happened when we came out of a Babylon and it happened when we came out of the, in the 20th century from exile towards the land of Israel. So everybody identifies with the truth, core truth inside the book of Esther, but it's very difficult to date. Then we have two books right at the end, uh, which are the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. They each have their own book and they're talking about how they are coming actually from the Persian Empire to set up all the spiritual and institutional foundations of the Jewish people. Things are going to be a little different now. Things are going to be a little different now. <laughs> There's going to be public readings of Torah. There's going to be, you know, you can't marry Gentile women as loosely as you could before. Some of the structures of Judaism going forward have their genesis in that very, very instrumental moment of Ezra and Nehemiah's establishment of how this second temple society is going to look and then if this talk now you don't like this talk then you can go to an extraordinary book called chronicles one and two divreha yamim which is a summary really of the whole of the story of humanity from adam right up to the end of the bible it actually takes you kind of where the book of sefer malachim got to into the babylonian exile but it does deal in a, a, a very, very quick uh, going through of all the different phases that we have spoken about. Have I left any books of the Tanakh out? Good. Obviously, maybe there's people on the other side of the camera going, oh, but you have, you have. I once again apologise that I went three minutes over. I want you to imagine being me and trying to get this information in the time that I can. I once again want to thank Chabad South Africa, uh, Dominion Shul in Melbourne, the Shul of Love, and I'm hoping that this <laughs> has made uh, some sense of the Tanakh and where things are. And I will emphasize, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Jewish history is not just about the past. It is also about the future. But the Tanakh is hugely important because it contains our foundational raison d'etre. It's, it's the reason, it's the core of the continuum is recorded in the Tanakh and no other nation has that. So it behoves us all to become familiar with the Tanakh, its structure, its narrative, its themes. And I'm hoping that what we've done today is able to set that against the ground of Jewish history. It has been an absolute honor to run this course. And I look forward, uh, uh, please God, in the uh, fullness of time to uh, meeting up with many of you. All the very best.